try again. A.T. Robertson and the Divinity of Christ in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 21 to 38. Robertson has entitled this section, The Anxiety of Jesus. Jesus is troubled in spirit, as he was by the grave of Lazarus back in chapter 11. He has said, I know whom I have chosen, according to 1318. He assumes his share of the responsibility for the selection of Judas, but that fact in no wise relieves Judas of his guilt. We are not mere automata or automata, however much of mystery surrounds us in this world of law. A sort of stupefaction seems to rest on the apostles. They are completely taken aback by the specific statement that the betrayer was one of their number, according to 1322. They even fail to grasp the point of the sign of the sop which Jesus gives to Judas, or to understand the word by which Jesus reveals to Judas knowledge of his treachery. They are all so intent in their suspicion about or suspicions plural about each other and protestations of innocence that they fail to see what is plainly before their eyes. But now Judas is gone out of out into the night on his hellish mission, and Jesus Jesus turns to the rest with something of the feeling of a hen who has lost one of her brood to the hawk who has swooped it away. He had so felt about Jerusalem. That is in reference to Matthew twenty three thirty seven, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you, etc. And now Satan has made complete conquest of Judas. The fact that Ju Jesus knew all along that Judas was a devil, according to John six seventy, does not lighten his sorrow, though it does relieve Jesus of any moral responsibility for this son of perdition. Indeed, Jesus turns to the glorification of the cross with a sense of relief as Judas goes away from their number. These discourses in John 13:31 to 17:26 bear the same relation to the fourth gospel that the eschatological discourse does to the synoptic gospels, and the two lines of thought are complementary. The one deals with the outward aspects of the kingdom in the future, the other with the inward growth of the soul. The glorification of the Son of Man and of God by the death of Jesus now fills his heart. This view of his death transcends all the petty meannesses of his enemies. Jesus even says in 1332 that God will take up the glorified humanity of the Son of Man into his own being. And that's a thought, of course, that is new to us if we're coming from the Watchtower world. The humanity of Christ is permanent albeit it is glorified humanity, as Robertson says here. Henceforth, the humanity of Jesus will be added glory to the Son of God. But after this exalted word about his own relation with the Father in his death, Jesus turns again to the eleven who are left with a promise that they shall follow him after a while, and with the command, meanwhile, to love one another as he has loved them, and so carry out the new commandment, an eleventh commandment, or summary, of the law. This very night they have already shown jealousy towards each other. The key to the work of the kingdom, after Jesus is gone, lies just here, in the love of Christians for each other. But Peter passes by this command and is curious to know whither he is going and why he cannot follow now, since he is willing to lay down his life for Jesus. So lightly does the chief apostle take the death of Christ and his own courage in the face of it. It is a painful thing to perform a surgical operation on a man's pride, but Jesus does it. However, Peter does not stand alone in his boasting, for all the rest join in the promise of fidelity till death, though Peter shows more vehemence. Luke reports Jesus is revealing that Satan has been allowed to sift you as wheat, and that Jesus has made special supplication for Peter. The anxiety of Jesus is not mere nervous apprehension. No one knows the power of the devil over men, as does he, for the very reason that he has vanquished him. The prescience of Jesus was meant to put the apostles on guard. His prayer for Peter will bring him back after his fall. That's a precious verse, by the way, from Luke 22, verse 32. He prayed for Peter that he would come back, and he didn't say, if you come back. He said, when you return. Presumption is merely weakness, is the last thought here. 
So all the disciples exhibited presumption right up until the end, right up to Gethsemane. Put in a link to one of our crossed cross videos, number four of that series, a balanced view of pagan connections. Why are Jehovah's Witnesses really enemies of the cross? Plus, I'll put a link into that playlist. See you soon.